How many of you got through all of your lesson? All right, we got two groups that got through their lesson. Shall we quiz them to see? Did you start right on time? No, you guys started well, well before. Okay, all right. Hey, you know what? When we meet together, we like to have fun, you know? Uh, growing up, I had to go to some church services where like being shot with a slow arrow. It was just painful, you know? And um, I think that God is a, has got a tremendous sense of humor. And I said this once before here, but I'll say it again. Have you looked in the mirror lately? He has a sense of humor. All right. Yeah, you'll catch it eventually. <laughs> All right, this is a heavy subject tonight. You've already delved into some heavy stuff here. And I want to say right off the bat tonight that I'm not here to give any offense to anyone. Um, and that's, that's truth from my heart. But I do know that the Bible is no respecter of persons. Have you noticed that? God deals with nations. He deals with individuals. He deals with churches. Just read the book of Revelation, the seven churches. So tonight as we begin our quest for understanding the Antichrist power, I pray that we will do it with caution, carefulness, and kindness. But I believe that we need to understand these things, especially in the time in which we're living right now. So let's pray together. Father in heaven, as we begin our study this evening, we pray for divine wisdom, understanding. And Father, I pray that you will control my lips and that I might represent you rightly from up here. Thank you. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who gives us wisdom and understanding in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. After doing this for over 35 years, I've heard almost every type of theory about the Antichrist power. There was a series a few years ago called the Left Behind series. How many of you have heard that? Now, or read the books. I've got the whole volume. You know, that was never a theological true study folks it was a fiction they were fictional and they had some bible verses in there and um, a lot of people have embraced that is that truth what you're going to find out there in the theological world that there are three main views to understanding bible prophecy the first one is called preterism how many of you've heard of preterism before I know it sounds almost like a doc. It almost sounds like some kind of disease. <laughs> and then there is a view called futurism. Very popular today. And then there is a view called the historic or the historicist view to Bible prophecy. All the great reformers of the past. Martin Luther, if you're a Lutheran here tonight, Martin Luther was a historicist. John Calvin, John Wesley, you're saying, you're, you're naming a lot of Protestants, that's right. The foundational principles of Protestantism, free will, the historicist view to Bible prophecy. Again, the word Protestant. A lot of people think that that means a protester against Catholicism. In its essence, it means pro-Testament, pro-Bible. In fact, the watchword of the Protestant Reformation was... Solo Scriptura, 
the Bible and the Bible alone as our guide to faith. Now, personally, I have chosen to follow the Bible. I just want you to know that right off the bat. Um, I'm not one for man's traditions, church fathers, great for history and so forth. But at the end of the day, it's the Bible and the Bible alone for me personally. I believe that the Bible is a safe book to follow. I believe that the Bible is inspired. It's the inspired word of God. In fact, you wouldn't be here if you didn't believe that. So as we take our journey tonight, I want to begin in a very interesting place. Most people, when they're talking about the Antichrist power, they like to begin at Revelation 13. And we're going to go to Revelation 13. But we have to stop and ask ourselves the question, what did the apostles believe? Especially that theologian who is sometimes a little difficult to understand. Who am I talking about? Paul. Paul. Yeah, you know. The Apostle Paul. So what I'd like to do tonight is look at Paul's view of the Antichrist. And let me give you a little hint. Paul borrows from Daniel. Okay? Jesus in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, borrows from Daniel. Their apocalyptic view comes from the prophet Daniel. And in order to understand the prophet Daniel, it doesn't hurt to understand the book of Ezekiel, the book of Isaiah. But for right now, we're going to go and we're going to see what Paul believed. And I'm going to put it in slow motion tonight because I believe that this is very important for us to understand. This is not sensationalism. This is not Hollywood production. This is not Steve Vail painting some big, wild picture. Like one guy in Kansas City came to a meeting and said, man... The beast is going to come up out of the Atlantic Ocean. I said, really? A real beast? Oh, yeah, he's going to be gobbling people up. The very beginning of the book of Revelation says that he sent and he signified it by his what? Angel. To show John things which must shortly take place. The word in the original language signified means through signs and symbols. So as we look at the book of Revelation, as we look at prophecy, many times God uses symbols to represent literal powers. Now, as we turn to the writings of Paul in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 1, this is Paul's view of the Antichrist power. And we're going to ask some questions as we look at these texts. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you. Now, let's look at this text carefully. Some of you are probably going to think back to when you were in a seminary class, George, and think that, you you know, Steve's not preaching tonight. He's just, he's like a professor up here. And by the way, you're all professors, right? Professors of Christ. I hope all of you have a B.A. Do you have a B.A.? You know what that means? Born again. There you go. (laughs) Now, brethren, Paul speaking to the church, the believers, concerning the what? The coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you. Now, Some folks try to take the word coming as one event. And then they say the gathering together is another event. And there are some years in between. 
I'm not going to go into great detail, but if you have a question about that, turn it in, because George loves the hard questions. But if you look at this in the original language, and any of you can, by using a concordance. You have a Greek, a Hebrew, and an Aramaic dictionary. And it's not difficult to read you will see that it's the same event, especially contextually. Now, notice what he goes on to say. Not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter as if from us, as though the day of Christ had what? Come. The whole context is about the coming of Christ. Now, notice what he goes on to say. Let no one deceive you by any what? means. So there would be deceptions rolling around about the coming of Christ. Now let me put you on pause for just a second. And I want you to think about the first coming of Jesus. Have you ever thought, those of you that are Bible students, have you ever thought about why the Jewish nation who they were to present to the world the coming of the Messiah, how they missed it. Have you ever thought about that? Why did they miss it? It's easy to understand. Here's what they did. Number one, they hated the Romans. They hated the Romans. I mean, the Romans were hard to love. And they had taken the Old Testament text, they being the scribes, the Pharisees, Sadducees. They had taken the text in the Old Testament that pointed forward to the Messiah coming in great glory and power. Talking about his second coming and they applied them to his first coming. That's what they did. They applied them to his first coming. So when Jesus came as a babe in the manger, he came to save their, the people from their sins, not in their sins. We find that they rejected the Messiah. The majority rejected the Messiah. Now, who do you think was in the shadows and had set that plan in motion, that false theology? They had taken Scripture... And misapplied the scripture so that people didn't get it. Now, the devil was the one that did this and he was very successful with it. And you know what? If I were the devil, man, and it worked so good the first time, and the majority of those that are supposed to be heralding the first coming of Christ misunderstood the scriptures and twisted it, and it worked so well that some wise men and some shepherds and a few others within Israel got the message, but the rest of them, for some reason, because of the prevalent theology of that day, they were not ready for the coming of the Messiah. If I were the devil, I would take that same principle and use it down here at the end of time and confuse people about the coming of Christ. Now, don't you think about that. This is serious stuff here. That's why Paul says to those in Thessalonica, let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come. Isn't that what it says? will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of what? Perdition. Think about that. Paul says that that day, the coming of Christ, the Antichrist, and you say, well, Steve, how do you know it's the Antichrist? We're going to see that in just a moment. Must appear before Jesus comes, not after. It goes on to say, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. 
Have you heard this kind of language before? Who spoke those words? Lucifer. Remember in Isaiah 14? Remember his claim? I will be like the Most High. My throne will be above the stars. All of that stuff. And remember in the book of Revelation, the issue is around worship. Who will we worship? If I were the devil, I'd get people sidetracked. I'd, 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 I would keep them out of the Bible and watching Hollywood movies about spiritual things. <laughs> that doesn't work. I would have them reading tabloids and fictional books and all kinds of things, but just never get into the Bible. This is what is to be in our hearts. The word of the living God. When you see this term, sits as God in the temple of God. Have you ever stopped to think, what does that mean, the temple of God? Most people who have not read deeply into the word, they're thinking it's a brick and mortar building. And that this antichrist, this atheistic antichrist is going to come into this brick and mortar building and he's going to cause the abomination of desolation. That teaching says that, <laughs> that the Jews have built the temple and now they're offering animal sacrifices. Why? Hasn't the Lamb of God already died upon the cross of Calvary? Why would we want to offer animal sacrifices? Makes no sense. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things, and now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. What power was ruling the world at this time when Paul wrote this? Rome. It was Rome. And then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his what? Coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power signs and lying wonders. And with all unrighteous deceptions among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be what? Saved. That's the key. The love of the truth. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the what? Why? It's Christ. Have you stopped today and asked yourself the question, Why am I so blessed? It's Christ. It's Christ. I praise Him every day. I'm not where I probably should be, but I'm not where I was. It was the Christ of the Bible that reached in and took the drugs and the alcohol and the nightclubs and all that stuff out of my life. It was only him because I tried to quit a bunch of times by myself. Couldn't do it. It was Christ. Christ and Christ alone. The bottom line is to receive the love of the truth, ladies and gentlemen. We've talked about intellectual knowledge about all of this stuff, and you can have all this head knowledge, and you, you, can, you can sit down and have a discussion with people at Starbucks, whatever, but I tell you what, at the end of the day, do you know Christ? Is Christ the center of your heart? Now, 
Let's break this down. When? Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed. So when will all this take place? After the first thing that happens, which is the man of sin is revealed. What is going to happen? The falling away. What does that mean? Who? The son of what? Perdition. You realize that the word that, that the phrase son of perdition is only mentioned one time in all of Scripture? One time. That's it. To describe Judas who betrayed our Lord. In other words, the popular Christianity would get caught up in a landslide apostasy and betray the essentials of the gospel while maintaining an outward form and profession of faithfulness. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to think about this. This is going to be foreign to some of you. But if we're going to be true to the text, was Judas a part of the twelve? Yes, he was. Did Christ love Judas? Judas had hereditary and cultivated tendencies to evil, just like Peter, James, and John. I mean, a couple of the guys were called sons of thunder. Listen, folks, and I mean this with all of my heart. Jesus kept bad company. He did. He hangs out with you. He does. I'm serious. You know, churches have painted Jesus as some kind of essence way away. No, He walks with us every day through the power of the Spirit. We have angels that protect us each and every day. God is near and close to us. For many of us, we don't hear it and we don't see it because we are too preoccupied with the here and now. And there's a fine balance of the two. It's a difficult balance. I understand that. But He loves us. He loves us very much. So Judas was part of the in crowd, but yet he chose to betray Jesus. Now, what you think about this, the son of perdition is the term that Paul uses. And the only other place in the Bible, it points to Judas. So what is Paul saying? I believe Paul is saying that the the Judas, the Antichrist, will come from within Christianity, not outside of Christianity. Wrap your mind around that one. Let me ask you a question. What is apostasy? It's when you're part of something and you what? You walk away from it. Let's continue. The Bible says that this leader would be a man called the man of sin. In the original Greek, the phrase is the man of lawlessness. Paul teaches here that this man would stand in opposition to the law of God. Where? In the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. The Bible says he sets himself up in the temple of God as God. In Ephesians 2, 19 through 22, Paul tells us, that the temple of God is a symbol for the church made up of believers. Let's read it. Ephesians 2.19 Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and the members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief what? Cornerstone. Notice, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the what? Spirit. Now, notice how Paul warned the church in Ephesus of the coming apostasy. 
Acts 20, verse 29. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also, from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. Is this important? Yeah. This is important. Three things Paul warned against. Number one, opposition from without. Damage of wolves as they attack the sheep. He also saw satanic persecutions that would attempt to destroy the church, yet the church would still survive. All you have to do is go back and look at the book of Fox, Fox's Book of Martyrs. How many of you have heard of that book? You've seen it. it, it you've got to have a strong stomach to read it. I don't have the time tonight to go through a lot of the tortures and things that they did in the Roman Empire to Christians. But here's one thing I do know. In the great theaters, where the gladiators would perform and die, sometimes they would take Christians and impale them on a pole, dip, pour hot tar over them, and light them on fire to light up the arena. I do know that you had to pay homage to Caesar. And there were times when Christians were brought into that arena, father, mother, children, and wild beasts would be there. And the father would be asked, will you recant this Christ and accept Caesar as God? And if he says, I will not, I recognize Jesus Christ as my Savior, they'd take one of the little children and say, you need to recant or we're going to throw it to the wild beast. Hey, dads. All of a sudden, this thing that you believe in has to be far more than what's just rolling around in your intellect. It better be part of your fiber and your being. I mean, possessing your heart. And there's the mother. Shaking and weeping and the child is taken and thrown to the wild animal. The next child. And then finally, the wife is looking at the husband and they say, Now, will you recant? Or we're going to throw your wife to the wild beast. And I hope my wife, if anything ever happened like that, that she would look at me and she would say, Christ and Christ alone. Ladies and gentlemen, Christianity has been so watered down today. We wear little braces. What would Jesus do? Jesus would stand. Jesus went to the cross. This is not some namby-pamby little cakewalk being a Christian. Paul says, put on the whole armor of God. The devil is after you and fiery darts are being shot at you. We must be filled with the Word of God and the Spirit of God to stand in this dark place. And the less time we spend in the Bible, we don't see all of this filth that's going on around us. And it's bad. But ladies and gentlemen, when the Word of God is in our lives, we see things. And we don't hate. We love. We love. So there was pressure on God's church from the outside. But this is the sad part to me. Number two, the second problem would be more serious. Apostasy from within. Men would arrive speaking perverse in the original language. Crooked or twisted things. Think about it. And I use this term, if I were the devil, very carefully. What would my plan be? I could care less about those people in the world. What, what good are they to me? 
I just keep them on a diet of nonsense, foolishness. I was listening to a podcast the other day. It was two guys talking about sports. And one guy said, I, I, you know, I can't believe it. For an hour and a half, we talk, we talk about stuff that really doesn't matter. Telling the truth. Now, don't think I'm raining on your parade. I'm not, you know, that, that's not my thing here. You'll never hear me preach against a TV set. You know, that's between you and God. What you watch on TV, what you look at on the computer, that's between you and the Holy Spirit. It's not my job. I'm not the Holy Spirit. But you see, ladies and gentlemen, the devil keeps the world on a maintenance program with weird religions and, and satanic rituals and, and garbage out there. But it's the Christians. It's those that claim to follow the Bible that are spending time in the Word of God. You become the target. You are in the crosshairs. He steps inside the church and tries to get us confused about what the Bible says. He's been doing it for centuries. Apostasy from within. Men would arise speaking perverse, crooked, or twisted things. And number three... The beginning of apostasy would come quickly, Paul said, of your own selves shall men arise. So let's review. The Antichrist is revealed before Christ's second coming. Number two, Antichrist would come from within the church. Number three, the mystery of Antichrist were already at work in Paul's day. You know what Antichrist means? In place of Christ. That's what it means. All through history we've seen people rising up saying that they're Christ. Now with this background, this is what Paul taught. Let's unlock the symbolic code of the beast of Revelation 13. With this in our minds, notice Revelation 13, 1. Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. If you back up to chapter 12 of Revelation... You find the definition of the dragon. The dragon is called who? Satan and the what? The devil. He is pictured as a dragon, a great red dragon. As you follow the context from 12 into 13... In the original manuscripts, there are no chapter divisions and verse divisions, which is, it, you know, it's neither here nor there. But in a lot of translations, Revelation 13, 1 is actually added to Revelation chapter 12. It doesn't really matter other than contextually it fits either way that this beast that's coming up, I like to call him an avatar. He is the avatar of the great red dragon. It's his earthly power to receive worship. Okay. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him power, his throne, and great authority. So who's behind this amalgamated beast that comes up out of the sea? Who's behind him? The dragon, right? And notice what the dragon does. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. Why would the devil do that? Because he wants what? Worship. 
So he creates an earthly system in which he can be worshipped. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded and his deadly wound was healed and all the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshipped the dragon, you see? That's the devil. So they worship the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worship the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for how long? Forty-two months. Now we're going to look at this time period tonight. Then he opened his mouth to blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell where? In heaven. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and what? Nation. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here's wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man whose number is what? 666. The prophetic books of the Bible usually deal in types and symbols. I wanted you to get the context. There was the sea beast, the earth beast, the dragons behind the whole thing. He wants worship. Now, we're going to look at this composite symbolic beast, but I want us to reestablish some symbolism. In symbolic Bible prophecy, seas represent people. Revelation 17, 15. War, or excuse me, wind represents war only in symbolic Bible prophecy, according to Jeremiah 49, 36, and 37. We've already looked at beast early in an earlier meeting as kingdoms. Daniel 7, 17, we looked at it. Now, as you look at this beast right here, seven heads, ten horns, the body of a leopard, the feet of a bear, and the mouth of a what? Lion. What we're going to see, ladies and gentlemen, is that this beast is an amalgamation of the four beasts of Daniel chapter 7, which we're going to look at in a few moments. And like I said the other night, doesn't that look like your husband, ladies, on Monday morning when he doesn't want to go to work? Huh? <laughs> All right, I'm going to get in trouble if I don't be careful here. Let's go back and look at the text carefully. Then I, saw, then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. So he comes up out of the sea. Revelation 17, 15, the waters which you saw are peoples, multitudes, nations, and what? Tongues. This is only in symbolic Bible prophecy. This first beast, this amalgamated beast, comes up out of a highly populated area. How are we going to understand this beast? Well, we're going to go to the book of Daniel. Now remember, on opening night, we looked at Daniel chapter 2. We found that the head of gold was Babylon. Chest of silver was the Medo-Persian Empire. The, The thighs of bronze was the Grecian Empire. Legs of iron, Roman Empire. The divided uh, toes made of iron and clay represent the divisions of Western Europe with the northern barbaric tribes swept down over Western Europe. Now, what does all of this mean? Daniel 2 is the 101 class. Then when you go to Daniel 7, the same prophecy is repeated. But it's enlarged upon. Now let me ask you a question about the repeat and enlarge. If you went to Mickey D's every day and ate 
two double cheeseburgers, a large shake, and not a large fry, but a basket of fries. If you kept repeating that every day, what would happen? You're going to enlarge, right? Yeah. In Bible prophecy, you get the main foundational principles in Daniel 2. When you get to Daniel 7, it's going to tell us the same thing Daniel 2 did, except it's going to give us more information. It doesn't have to be the same symbols. When you get to Daniel chapter 8, it gives you more information and it repeats the same thing. So the repeat and enlarge principle is used here. You're following the context, which is very important. So, in Daniel 7 and verse 2, Daniel spoke saying, I saw in my visions by night, and behold, the four winds of the heaven were stirring up the great sea. With this in mind, that the winds represent warfare, and the great sea is where there are a lot of people. And you say, Steve, that's a stretch. Wait, you'll see it in the context. I'm just calling this to your attention right now. Watch. Daniel 7, 3. And four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. Now, what are they? The Bible says those great beasts, which are four, are four kings, which shall arise out of the what? Thus he said, in verse 23, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on the earth. So if the fourth beast is the fourth kingdom on earth, the first three have to be the first three kingdoms on earth. Now the Bible begins to tell us about these beasts. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings, and I watched till its wings were plucked off. And it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man. And a man's heart was given to it. The king of beasts corresponds to the head of gold, the most precious metal in the image. Babylon was the first. In Daniel 7, he's represented by a great lion with eagle's wings. Babylon ruled from 605 to 539 B.C. Babylon was a pagan empire. Many times the Bible would say the Assyrians are coming to punish Israel. If you've studied the Bible in detail, especially the Old Testament, you understand how crooked and corrupt Babylon was. How vile their worship services were. The very word Babylon, Babel, confusion. Then a second beast comes, and suddenly another beast, a second, like a bear. It was raised up on one side. By the way, why did this, this lion have wings? The great speed in which Nebuchadnezzar was able to come to power. Stand on the feet like a man, with a man's heart given to it. It's Nebuchadnezzar at the head of the power. And suddenly a, another beast, a second, like a bear. It was raised up on one side, and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said, thus to it, arise and devour much flesh. The reason why the bear was raised up on one side is that the Persians were stronger than the Medes. What about the three ribs in his mouth? The three provinces over which the Persian Empire ruled from 539 to 331 B.C. Notice the three ribs. Babylon, they overtook Babylon. Lydia and Egypt, representing the three kingdoms in which this power was able to overtake. In Daniel 7, 6, After this I looked, and there was another, like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. Mm. My first job I ever had when I was 14. You know, Back in the day when I was growing up, you didn't have to wear seat belts in cars. You didn't have to wear bicycle helmets. 
I mean, when you think about those of you that are in your 60s, I mean, it was, safety wasn't a big thing, was it? No. I mean, like I took a two by four to the head today. No, no one hit me. I did the stupid thing and walked into it. But I had my first job. And this first job was at the zoo. They were building a new zoo. Half of it was finished and the other half. And this was a summertime job and I made lots of money. I was getting a dollar and 42 cents an hour. I'll never forget. Oh, I was so proud. But that was back when fuel was like, well, I was paying 16 cents a gallon. A Snickers candy bar. And who doesn't love a Snickers? A nickel. There were no computers. In fact, when I was a kid, we watched black and white TV. No color TV. And so I get this job at the zoo. I'm there to do construction. And uh, I was from Baton Rouge. And the, guy, the, 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 uh, the zoo was in a place called Baker, Louisiana. Have you ever watched the Beverly Hillbillies? Remember Ellie Mae? She was from Baker, Louisiana. Anyway, I never knew her, but we were proud. And so anyway, this zookeeper has to go out of town. And they figured I was a responsible 14-year-old. Come on. I'm 14. Oh, and listen, some of the initiations that the guys from Baker made us go through, I had to jump in the alligator pit, run across, touch the alligator on the back, and jump on the other side. Or they were going to haze me by pulling my britches down. I mean, you were kids. I've got a scar on my arm right now from one of those wild birds. I had to run in there and try to grab one. Nowadays, you go to jail for that kind of stuff. We were kids. So anyway, this zookeeper guy that was taking care of three cat cages was going on vacation. And believe it or not, hand on the Bible, they asked me to take care of those three cat cages while he was on vacation. Fourteen years old. One of the cages had a leopard in it. One had a black panther. And the other one had some kind of weird cat. I don't even remember what it was. But my job every day was to go and put the food. I won't gross you out. Put the food in the back of the cage. Make sure that that metal plate with the crank was locked out and the cat was in the front. And I went in the back and I put the food out. Then you go out, you lock the back door, you make sure it's the cage is locked. And you walk around, 14! And you click the thing and you're like, you know, you reel it up. Boom! That cat's back there. Boom! That food's gone. Now, once he's back there, you let the door down, you go back out, you lock it out, you make sure. And then you spray out the front of the cage. It's not rocket science what I was doing. One day I was spraying out the cage and I got close to that metal plate. And that cat, and it was one of them, a leopard, slammed a paw against that metal plate. And you know what my first thought was? Dessert. That I was going to be the dessert. Now the reason I'm bringing this story up is that that leopard I saw had one head. This leopard has four heads. Have you ever seen a four-headed leopard? Have you ever seen a leopard with wings? 
This is a symbolism, isn't it? It's a symbol. So what do the four heads represent and the four wings? And why do we need to know this stuff anyway? Because we're headed for Daniel chapter 8. And in order to understand Daniel 8, we've got to get this. The beast also had four heads and dominion was given to it. Now, Babylon rises and falls. The Medo-Persian Empire overtakes them. Then according to history, who was the power that overthrew the Medo-Persian Empire? Alexander the Great. The Grecian Empire. I'd like to submit to you the four wings represent the great speed in which Alexander the Great was able to take the then known world. But what about the four heads? Remember, Alexander the Great died in his early 30s. He could conquer the world, but he had a problem with the bottle. He had an alcohol problem. But he had a high fever that was brought on by his intemperance. And some have suggested that he died at the age of 33. He could conquer the world, but yet he was conquered. The four heads represent the four divisions. And history backs this up. The four divisions of Alexander's kingdom. His four generals said, why should we fight among ourselves? This is history. Let's divide up. This vast empire into four parts. And that's exactly what happened. Greece ruled from 331 to 168 B.C. The four heads, Cassander, Lysimachus, Ptolemy, Seleucus. These four represent the four heads or the four divisions of Alexander's kingdom. Now, notice what comes next. After this, I saw in the night vision, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had how many horns? Ten horns. Daniel had nothing in the real world to tie this thing to. This is the thing of mythology, it seems like. But what's the next kingdom? Rome. The Roman Empire. Well, that thing's ugly, isn't it? So after Rome, you have divided Europe. The feet of iron and clay. And that's what happened to the Roman Empire. She imploded. The northern barbaric tribes, the Goths, swept down. And because Rome was so perverted and had become so careless and so bent on entertainment, they loved their programming the masses were given free food entertainment all the time at the Colosseum I don't think we're too far away ladies and gentlemen when you forget where you've come from You will drift where you don't want to be. Ten divisions of Western Europe. Representing the ten horns on the head of that beast. But I want you to notice something very interesting. He says, I was considering the horns. And there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them. Before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the what? If you want to get rid of something, what do you do? A plant? You pull it up by the what? By the roots. And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking pompous words. Who is this little horn? I'd like to submit to you tonight. The beast that was, is, and is yet to come. 
God was, is, and is yet to come. It's always a counterfeit to truth. This is the one that was. Same power. This little horn power is none other than the rise of the Antichrist power. And God had to show us from Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome, ten divisions. And the little horn comes up. Point number one about this power. This power comes up among them. We're going to look at several identifying points. And on another night, we're going to look at those identifying points. But I want you to put on your thinking caps right now. Where were those other ten horns located? Do you remember? Geographically where? Western Europe. So this little horn comes up geographically in Western Europe. Point number two. If it came up among the ten, it had to come up after the year 476 A.D. And you say, well, wait a minute, Steve. Let's go back. The official date. For the fall of the Roman Empire was 476 A.D. The divisions had to be there. Rome had fallen. The divisions were there. Then all of a sudden out of this this ten horn division, this little horn comes up and he takes three with him. The Heruli, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths, ladies and gentlemen, were uprooted by this power. All you got to do is go and look that up. You'll know exactly what power did that. By the way, the word Vandals, we get our word vandalism. Point three, it would be a little horn, Daniel 7, 8, or a little kingdom. Point number four, Daniel 7, 8, it uproots three of the kingdoms which we've already talked about. Point number five, Daniel 7, 8. It has a man at its head, and this man speaks for it. Point number six. It was different. The other powers were political powers. This power would be different. Daniel seven twenty five. It would speak great words or blasphemies. Now, we need to stop right here and ask ourselves the questions. What are great words or blasphemy? Now, we could go to Webster. You could give me your definition. I could give you my definition. But we want a biblical definition of blasphemy, do we not? We do. So, Revelation 13, 5. Now, remember, Daniel 7, Revelation 13 go hand in hand. In Revelation 13, 5, and he that amalgamated beasts, what you're going to see here tonight, ladies and gentlemen, I'll just give you a fast forward this thing. The little horn of Daniel 7 and the amalgamated beast of Revelation 13, the sea beast, they're the same thing. Six identifying points that match them both together. The one that was, the one that is, and the scarlet harlot, the lawless one. And what color was missing from her? Blue. Blue. That's right. We talked about that the other evening. Oh, no, Saturday morning. The blue is missing. No, in fact, we talked about that Tuesday night. Yeah. And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for how long? Don't forget that 42 months. In John 10, 24, the Jews, now this is a definition of blasphemy. Then the Jews surrounded him, the him being Jesus, and said to him, How long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us what? Plainly. Now notice how Jesus responds. In John 10.30, I am my Father, or what? Now that sent them to a 10. Notice what happens next. Verses 31 and 32. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works have I shown you from my Father, for which of those works do you stone me? And here's the answer. Verse 33. The Jews answered, saying, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And because you, being a man, make yourself God. One biblical definition 
A blasphemy is for a man to claim to be God on earth. If I stood up here and I said, hey, folks, I'm God. You know what I would do if I were you? I'd find the exit signs. Now, ladies, some of you have felt like a God before. You say, what do you mean, Steve? Well, when your husband says he's going to cook for you and he offers you a burnt sacrifice. (laughs) I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands. Guys, dare not go there. Don't go there. This is a voice of experience. Your wife has never offered you a burnt sacrifice. Even if it's burnt to a crisp, it's just charcoal. It's good for you. You better be good. I feel for you. He's quite a catch, isn't he? Oh, I don't want to put you on the spot. You might have to lie, and I wouldn't want you to do that. Oh, I love these two right here. They're fun. I got to be good. The Jews answered him saying, for a good work, do not, uh, we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And because you being a man, make yourself God. Now there's another definition of blasphemy. Mark chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic son, your sins are forgiven you. And some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Now this is a place where the roof of the house was opened up and these guys had carried their friend there and dropped him down at the foot of Jesus. I want friends like that. They climbed up there and took the roof apart. Probably one of them was saying, you think this is a good idea? Hey, this is my buddy. I'm going to put him right in front of Jesus. We'll worry about fixing the roof later. That's commitment. That's a friend. Do you have that kind of friend, guys, that you could call at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning and they'd show up, you were stuck in a ditch or something? I don't know why you'd be out at 3 or 4 in the morning, but let's just say something comes up. i got some friends that are like that. Doesn't matter what time they call. Or I call them. It's very rare, but there are times. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. And some of the scribes were sitting there, reasoning in their hearts. Why does this man what? Speak blasphemies like this. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Another identifying mark of blasphemy is for a man or a church to claim that they have the power to forgive sins. That's blasphemy. Now, you know the Bible says that we're to forgive one another, right? The Bible makes it clear that if I want to come before God and pray, but yet I've done something to my brother here, and I've wronged him, I need to go to him and say, brother, would you please forgive me? And hopefully he'd say yes. Then I go to God and say, Lord, I've gone and I've made it right with my brother. Now let me ask you something. I've asked him to forgive me, but does he have the power to deal with the sin that I've committed against him? No. No. Only the blood of Jesus wipes out sin. Only the blood of Jesus can deal with sin, my friends. And so for a man to say that he has the authority and the power to forgive you of your sins, that is not biblical. It's unbiblical. He would be a persecuting power. We'll leave that for later. Point number nine, he would think to change times and laws. The lawless one. Point number 10, it would rule. Now, we're going to spend a little time with this before we close tonight. It would rule for a time, times, and the dividing of times. What does this mean? Let's go back to Revelation chapter 12. 
We're looking for the key principles to help us unlock this time period. Time times the dividing of time. But the woman, it's a church, was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time, times, and half a time from the presence of who? Just a little side note here. Remember we talked about the woman that didn't have the blue? Where was she located? Do you remember? In the what? In the wilderness. Both women in the book of Revelation go into the wilderness. One comes out, the other stays. It's got huge implications, which we'll see in the later presentation. Might fly into the wilderness where she is nourished for a what? Time? What does it say? Time? Times and half a time. Same language that is used in Daniel chapter 7. Now notice verse 6, same woman, same wilderness, same serpent after her, but notice how the time period is explained here. And she has a place prepared for her by God that they should feed her there 1,200 and what? 60 days. So one spot you have time, times, half a time, And here you have 1,260 days. How do we make sense of this? Now, let's add one more component to this. Revelation 13, 5. And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemy. And he was given authority to continue for how long? 42 months. Now, we got three time periods. We got to figure out, are they three different time periods? Or are they all the same time period? Well, let's look at this 1,260 days. That's what the Bible says. Time equals one year. Times equal two years. Half a time equals what? Three and a half years. Or half a year, excuse me. How long was Jesus on the earth ministering from his baptism to the cross? Three and a half years. This power is counterfeiting everything about Christ. He comes up out of the water. Christ comes up out of the water of baptism to begin his ministry. Christ receives the wound on the cross. The beast receives the wound, the deadly wound. The beast is resurrected. Christ is resurrected. It's all there, folks. I could spend the rest of the evening just talking about the parallels. Now, let's understand this. This is part of the historicist view to Bible prophecy, which the great scholars of the past, the great reformers used. It's a day for a year in Bible prophecy. Now, not everywhere the Bible says a day, it's a year. It's only in symbolic Bible prophecy. I have appointed thee each day for a year, Ezekiel 4, 6. So if you have 1,260 prophetic days, that equals 1,260 literal years. Now... Who's one of the most famous scientists of our past history here in America? Or, I shouldn't say in America, but in the world. Sir Isaac Newton wrote more about spiritual things than he did scientific. Did you know that? He did. And he used the day for a year principle. Now, let's look at the application here as we wind up tonight. A month in Bible prophecy is equal to 30 days. Notice what I said, a month in Bible prophecy. And I'm going to show you how this is reckoned. This reckoning is based upon the lunar month of 29.56 days, rounded to 30 days. This works perfectly. So a time would equal one year. And a time would equal 12 months. Or times would equal 12 months. Half a time would equal 360 days. So, times two years equals 24 months. 
equals 720 days. Half a time would equal a half a year, six months, 180 days. So a time times and a half a time equals three and a half years, which equals 42 months, which equals 1,260 days. You use a day for a year principle, you have 1,260 years. All three of the time periods are the same. So you say, Steve, what time period is this? In your lesson, you will see this. This is the dark ages, ladies and gentlemen. The little horn of Daniel 7 is the medieval church of the dark ages that would continue into the future and eventually develop into that nondescript beast of Revelation 13. And ultimately... She's pictured in Revelation 17 as a church controlling the state. A beast is a nation. This is heavy stuff. This is not something that Steve Vale has come up with. I'm just telling you tonight, I'm standing on the shoulders of the great reformers that have gone before. This is the theology that in the 1600s the Baptist church taught. This is the teachings that the Lutheran church taught years ago. The Presbyterians taught this. In fact, all the Protestant, the Protestant churches taught this. But it's been lost. And somebody has created a counter reformation to the Great Reformation to get people off track. I warned you that this is heavy stuff tonight. So who is the little horn? Here it represents, right here, the Church of Rome. You're quiet. It's made up of Babylon, Greece, uh, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. They're all pagan, sun-worshipping kingdoms of the past. And what God is showing us here in Revelation 13, He's showing us that this amalgamated beast is paganism mingled with Christianity. Now you might say, Steve... You're being hard on the Roman Catholics here tonight. No. I grew up in the very shadow of the St. Pius Church. When I became a Christian, I went and sat down with Father Green. They were going to send me, I'm telling you the truth, hand on the Bible, to the Vatican to become a priest. But I got to thinking about it. I wanted to get married. I'm serious. And I knew I couldn't get married if I was a priest. But the more I studied the Bible, the more I became convicted and convinced that it's the Bible and the Bible only, not church tradition plus the Bible. Not the teachings of a man. All my friends were altar boys. My grandmother on my mother's side was a Roman Catholic. I grew up in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. You understand there's only parishes in Louisiana. There's no such thing as a county. Everything is saint, saint this, saint that. I have great respect for Roman Catholic people. That's not what I'm talking about here tonight. I'm talking about a system of worship. And you know what's amazing to me? Those of you that are Protestants are going to be tempted to say, oh, this is far-fetched, Steve. You've been disconnected from church history. Don't pass this off lightly. This is important. It's very important. I'm not going to stand up here tonight and talk about the Knight Templars and all of that kind of History Channel stuff. This is biblical. What has been will be again. 
So we find that this amalgamated beast is made up of all these pagan empires of the past. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear. And his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded and his deadly wound was healed. And how much of the world? Marveled and followed the beast. This is serious. This is to be revealed before Jesus comes. And so they worship the dragon who gave authority to the, to the beast. And they worship the beast saying, who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemy. He was even given authority to continue for 42 months. Then he opened his mouth and blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. From 538, when Justinian gave authority to the papacy for for. 1260 years, it's documented in history, to 1798 when the French Revolution began. And the Pope was taken to Valence, and 18 months later he died, and, and most of Europe swore that the Church of Rome would never rise again, and that's when secular humanism came in. Know your history. It's far more important to understand where we have been. I would like to suggest you understand the history of Europe. The rise of the Plantagenet kings that came from Germany and France and culminated in Britain and what happened there. I look at history of everything, ladies and gentlemen. If I see a rabbit, I want to know the hole that the rabbit came from. And I can tell you right now, Fox News, CNN, they're not going to tell you this stuff. Study your Bibles. Understand history. We're about to close. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. And it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. I suggest that you go home and you study the Council of Trent. Three meetings. First one was all about the Church of Rome getting rid of Martin Luther and the reformers and to come up with a new interpretation of the book of Revelation. Two Jesuits, Rivera and Algazar. One came up with futurism, one came up with preterism. I'll explain those in the future. This is history. And you know who points this out very clearly? Jerry B. I want to say Jenkins. I don't think that's right. He was a co-writer of the Left Behind series. That theology in those books were based off of futurism. Just need to know history. Some people will say, oh, no. Ladies and gentlemen, study the Bible. No history. Please do not leave here tonight saying that Steve Vale is berating, running down Roman Catholic people. I am not. You may be one. My best friends growing up were Roman Catholic. There are a lot of Christians among the Roman Catholic Church. It's the system. And I grew up with the system. 
How many of you would like to say with me tonight, I want to have an ear and I want to hear. Would you like to raise your hand tonight? Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the truth of your word. Sometimes it's painful. I pray that no one will misunderstand. And Lord, prepare us for Saturday morning as we study Daniel chapter 8 and Daniel chapter 9. Prepare us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to suggest between now and Saturday morning that you read Daniel 8 and 9. Some heavy, heavy stuff there. We're just moving along. God bless you and good night. If you have questions, feel free to write those questions down, okay?